what we really do is get our patients to focus on what it is, and I mean very specifically, that they want to be able to do in the last decade of their life. Do you want to be able to walk up a flight of stairs unassisted? Do you want to be able to get up off the floor unassisted? Do you want to be able to pick a child up off the ground? But let me tell you, if you don't train for that, it won't happen. We get people to be very clear on what their goals are. We figure out what are the requirements? What are the physical and physiologic requirements to hit those goals? You've got to kind of have like a good reason to do it. Dr. Peter Atia is the founder of Early Medical, a medical practice that applies the principles of Medicine 3.0 to patients with the goal of lengthening their lifespan and simultaneously improving their health span. He's the host of The Drive, one of the most popular podcasts covering the topics of health and medicine. He is also the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Outlive the Science and Art of Longevity. Peter, I feel like everyone probably already knows who you are. They've probably read your book Outlive as of almost a year ago now, and um, and maybe even been following along on your podcast. But it is such a pleasure to bring you on the show today to really talk to my audience specifically, which is a lot of young, busy moms who want to stay fit. So for the ones who don't know who you are, can you kind of give us a little bit of your background and how you got into servicing clientele to prevent disease and really elongate their lifespan. Well, it's nice to be here, Kelly, and thanks for having me. Um, so I'm, uh, I, I guess I wear several hats, but uh, maybe the one that's most germane is that uh, you know, I'm a practicing physician and I, along with the people on my team, you know, we, we practice something called Medicine 3.0, um, which is Maybe not the best name because it's not especially descriptive, although I suspect we'll talk about it. But we, we basically practice um, medicine in a way that is really geared towards um, optimizing longevity, which is not just living longer, that's called lifespan, but more importantly, uh, improving health span or quality of life throughout life. And in particular, focusing kind of at, you know, tangibly, how do you really make the final years of your life exceptional, which necessitates that everything before that is even more exceptional. A hundred percent. We can think about older people and their quality of life. Can they, are they active? Do they have their cognitive <clears throat> abilities? Are they really living their best life? And that's what you're talking about. So when it comes to medicine 3.0, you know, I've, I've been, I spent the last decade working with a bunch of functional MDs who run a bunch of tests on my clients and I work with them on their diet, but how is medicine 3.0 different from you know, the traditional model and the functional model that's out there right now. Medicine 2.0, which is kind of the paradigm we're in, is um, is obviously a very important, if not giant, leap forward from the way medicine was practiced for millennia. So medicine 1.0, which is basically medicine without science, kind of voodoo, you know, witchcraft medicine, is you know, effectively the system we lived in for most of human history, and it perhaps once in a while got things right. I mean, Hippocrates clearly acknowledged that food was medicine, so there's there's truth to that, of course, but it never actually got anything right deliberately, right? There was never any science to demonstrate this, and, and obviously the most, uh, you know, telling example of this was the failure to appreciate micro, uh, you know, microscopic, you know, uh, life, right? Be it bacteria, viruses, and parasites. And so not surprisingly, up until the latter part of the 19th century, you know, human lifespan was very short and human life was full of incredible amounts of suffering. Um, you know, for moms listening to this, you can only imagine what it would have been like to have a child without the help of medicine. And it's not surprising that infant mortality and maternal mortality was the roof. My, both my wife and daughter would not be alive without modern medicine based on a complication that my wife had. So both the baby, who's now my 15-year-old girl, and my daughter and my mother, my, my wife would have <laughs> clearly... Like Freudian slip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they, would have, they would have both died uh, without, without, um, without, without any um, hesitation. And so um, between, you know, addressing the challenges of... Um, having children, and then obviously addressing the challenges of infectious diseases, in the span of about four or five generations, human lifespan has doubled. So all of that falls under the guise of medicine 2.0, and it is truly remarkable, right? So the ability to take care of infections and acute problems 
and childbirth. Those are the big three things that have uh, literally uh, doubled, if not slightly more than doubled, human lifespan. Okay. Um, so why would we even entertain moving to something called Medicine 3.0? What's wrong with Medicine 2.0? Well, Medicine 2.0 has, for all of its successes, basically had very little success against chronic diseases. And in large part because we've done so well at treating acute conditions, we're now left with a situation where, you know, frankly, most of us are going to die of chronic conditions. And that's been true for 100 years, but we haven't actually made progress to much of an extent in those chronic conditions. And so what Medicine 3.0 hopes to do is actually come up with a new paradigm. So just as Medicine 2.0 was a complete shift from Medicine 1.0, um, medicine 3.0 needs to kind of be the same to that. And it needs to hang on to the things that medicine 2.0 does well, but it needs to really go many steps further. Um, so I'll give you three areas in which I think that's necessary. So uh, the first is in what do we measure? Because uh, what gets measured gets managed. So in medicine 2.0, not surprisingly and totally reasonably, the metric of interest is lifespan, mm -hmm. right? So if you Think about what people talk about in medicine. They talk about mortality, all-cause mortality, life expectancy. These are the variables of interest. I just did it a minute ago when I explained how lifespan doubled. Yeah. And so what gets measured gets managed means that when that's the metric of interest, that's what the system focuses on extensively. And what I would argue is that in Medicine 3.0, we should be focusing much more on health span. So cognitive health, physical health, so the actual robustness of the physical body, so strength endurance, flexibility, balance, these things, and emotional health. <clears throat> None of those things typically get talked about in the traditional medical system. And therefore, it's not a surprise that given that your doctor probably doesn't know your VO2 max or, you know, any metric of your strength or muscle mass, why would they then be expected to manage those things? Second component is in medicine 2.0, the, the, the benchmark, the foundation upon which medicine 2.0 is built is that of the randomized control trial. And the randomized control trial gives us something called evidence-based medicine, which has given us many wonderful things. But it is a system with limits. So evidence-based medicine assumes that you can actually run a, cl a clinical trial that will answer a question. It also takes very heterogeneous data. So you look at thousands of individuals, you look at the statistical average of those, and you give sort of homogeneous recommendations, which on average work, but clearly don't work at the individual level, given the heterogeneity of responses and in individuals that went in. And so what we want to do is sort of evolve from just a mindset of purely evidence-based medicine into one of evidence-informed medicine, where we use not just the findings of randomized control trials, but we look maybe a little bit deeper at some of the other data, both mechanistic and partition data within these RCTs, to get a more nuanced approach for how to treat a given individual. The, the next major principle then is the, the timing of when you apply the tools, which I assume we'll talk about. And this is again an area where the playbook for Medicine 2.0 um, is based on its early successes, which is you treat the problem acutely. Mm -hmm. When the problem arises, you treat it. Um, and again, that works pretty well for acute problems, but it doesn't work well for chronic problems. So you don't, you know, by the time a person has a heart attack or has a significant burden of cardiovascular disease on their angiogram, um, it's not that you can't make a difference by treating them, but you've missed an enormous window. The window to really treat them was 30 years earlier. Right. Same is true with cancer. The same is true with Alzheimer's disease. So anyway, I've said probably a little too much, but, but it is, it's an important concept. And I, and I think it's, um, it, 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 it underpins everything we'll probably talk about. Yeah. Can we, can we talk about some of these chronic lifestyle diseases that the majority of Americans are, are dying from and, and how, what are, you know, medicine 2.0, how it's missing the mark. Some of the, maybe it's heart disease and statins or, or where, you know, where it's failing. So I call these things the four horsemen, right? So there are these four chronic disease buckets that, again, most people listening to us and watching us are going to die from. Um, so, you know, at least statistically speaking, this is how most people in the developed world 
uh, die. So it's, you know, first and foremost, cardiovascular disease, so heart attacks and strokes. Uh, second, cancer. Uh, third, dementing diseases and neurodegenerative diseases. So that's Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia, along with neurodegenerative diseases outside of dementia, such as Parkinson's disease. Um, and then it's really a foundation or spectrum of metabolic conditions ranging from hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance through fatty liver disease up into type 2 diabetes. And so while not many people today, fortunately, die directly from type 2 diabetes, um, the number of people who die directly attributed to complications of the disease in, in, in the sort of immediate uh, nature it would probably number in the tens of thousands. But it's that when you have type 2 diabetes or frankly are anywhere along that spectrum of metabolic disease, your risk of those first three horsemen goes up really dramatically uh, to the tune of one and a half to two X. So 50 to 100% increase in risk. So that's how diabetes kills people. It doesn't kill them today because they become acutely hypoglycemic or, you know, they die from an infection when they have gangrene in their toe and it spreads. I mean, yes, that still happens, but they're mostly dying from heart disease, cancer, and dementia. Yeah. I mean, I it was personally afflicted by that with my father-in-law, you know, 10, 15 years of type 2 diabetes turned into strokes, turned into dementia, turned into, yeah. you know, not being able to take care of himself. And, and unfortunately, we lost him. But like that type of health span at the end is so hard to watch. And it costs our healthcare system millions and billions of dollars every single year. And I think what, you know, what's funny, I was reading your book last March when it came out, driving to Mammoth, my husband's like, why did you bring a textbook? <laughs> <laughs> well, it kind of looks like one, but there are a lot of strategies and tactics that you provide in your book, Outlive, that help us all avoid that end. Um, so can we, it, it's interesting to me, the way you've, you've put together your tactics as exercise being the first, can we, can we sort of talk through the four tactics that you talk about in your book, starting with exercise and, and you, can you tell me why you started with exercise first? Yeah. So I really only included four of the kind of domains in the book, exercise, nutrition, sleep, and emotional health. I didn't write an entire chapter on the fourth one, which of course is pharmacology. So, you know, that includes everything from, you know, medications to hormones to supplements. Um, although there's a little bit of that sprinkled in there, but um, that then it would have turned into a textbook. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think the reason I, I, I start with exercise and exercise gets three chapters. So it actually gets more discussion than any other topic in the book as far as interventions go. Um, is because, you know, there is no intervention that has demonstrated, uh, and that includes all of the medications that I don't even go into great detail on, but there's no intervention that has a greater impact on both the length of life and the quality of life. Um, and I go so far as to say that even if exercise had zero bearing on your length of life, what even if it shortened your life by a year, mm -hmm. right? All this exercise shortened your life by a year, I argue it would still be worth it given what it brings in terms of quality of life as you age. So the fact that it not only does that, but also elongates life more than anything, and it's not close, by the way. It's like it's one of the, you know, once in a while, biology gives you things where the answer is just so abundantly clear. You don't actually need statistics to parse it out. Um, it's for that reason that I wanted people to, you know, if they, if they were only going to be able to spare enough attention to, you know, hear one thing, I wanted this to be the thing they heard. Absolutely. And there's so much dense research there. Is there a specific <laughs> study or um, randomized control trial that you feel like really like slammed the nail with the hammer on, in regards to sh to being proof in your pudding as to why we should be active? And what are what are some of the your favorite pieces of research there that could motivate the audience to get going, especially if someone's had children recently or have, has gotten out of the routine? And like, wh where's the motivation? Because I feel like science is my biggest motivator when it comes to showing up and, and creating habits in my life for my family. Um, what, what are some of your favorites? So that's actually, in, in some ways, what makes it so remarkable is there is you don't need, there isn't just one study, it's the overwhelming body of the literature that is so consistent. And for example, 
This is where exercise and nutrition are so different, right? In the field of nutrition, you can look to a certain relatively small number of studies that have, you know, really changed the way we think about things. I would argue that the Predimed trial, um, which we can maybe talk about, is, is a very important study in nutrition, but it stands out in a sea of noise as a signal. And in, uh, you know, in nutrition, we have this problem where the epidemiology never points in the same direction. So, you know, it, everything basically cancels everything out. And that almost assuredly speaks to the fact that none of the signals are very strong. Mm -hmm. That's why one day eating red meat looks bad and another day eating red meat looks good. That's why one day drinking coffee looks bad and another day drinking coffee looks good. It's because the effect size is so minor and there are so many confounders that play a larger role that this is not really the way to do serious inquiry. Conversely, in exercise, the epidemiology is always, for the most part, screaming in the same direction. Um, and so when you look at the largest cohorts, um, not only do you see consistency in magnitude and direction, um, you see an effect size that is, even if the effect size itself is a little bit big, um, and maybe bigger than what it would be, you know, in real life, um, you know that there's a real signal there. So, for example, if you look at, and I talk about both of these, if you look at the two largest cohorts of uh, populations, these are populations that collectively include over 1 million people. Um, VO2 max, so the test for your maximal aerobic function, uh, is the strongest predictor of lifespan. So again, two completely different populations, two different methodologies, both come to the same answer, which is, you know, VO2 max, uh, having a very high VO2 max is more predictive of a long life than anything else. And conversely, having a very low VO2 max is more predictive of having a very short life. And that's even when you compare it to, for example, smoking or type 2 diabetes or high blood pressure or any of the other things that we see are clearly associated with a shortened life. The same is true with metrics like muscle mass and strength. Uh, in fact, if VO2 max is the highest uh, association with a long life, the second highest is a high degree of strength. And this can be measured in a number of ways, but the studies that look at this either using grip strength or using you know, leg strength, wall sits, various sorts of tests, they, they point to the same thing. And um, perhaps somebody listening asks, why is that the case? Like, why would being strong and having high cardiorespiratory fitness measured by a VO2 max test be important? And the reason is that those are some of the least malleable biomarkers we have, right? They take a long time to change because they take a long time to do the work to see the change. So when, if we have a patient that comes in and they're very weak and their VO2 max is very low, you know, we walk them through the rationale for why we want to see these things improve dramatically. But we set realistic expectations, which is, this is not something you're going to fix this year. You know, this year we will improve, no doubt. But this will take many years to get you in the, the shape that it would take to be in the top, you know, five or 10% of your age and sex. Now, it's totally achievable, but it takes day in and day out work. And it takes consistency. And so when you see a person with a high VO2 max and high strength, what you are looking at is a person who has done a lot of work. And those things then become the metric of the work, just as a hemoglobin A1C tells you what the glucose load has looked like and how the glucose disposal has been over the past three months. It, the word we use for that in math or physics or engineering would be it integrates. So the hemoglobin A1C integrates the glucose pattern over the past three months and similarly, the VO2 max and strength and muscle mass, they integrate the amount of exercise a person has done over many years. Yeah, and I, I mean, just as a, a mom and a, a person who's been um, affected by family members with cancer and falls, you think about later in life, a fall without strength and muscle mass and agility, uh, cachexia with cancer, you can think about fighting COVID-19, like, all of that, it's, it's, you know, it's your armor. And in, in 
for your health span. So when it comes to someone who has maybe been really active growing up, you know, I can use myself as a personal example. Example, I played very competitively in club soccer and lifted weights with a trainer and went into three pregnancies in five years. And I would say consistency has been more of a weekly thing and less of a daily thing, which used to be my medicine. And I can't wait till I have the flexibility to get back to that. But when it comes to losing some muscle mass and rebuilding it, what can someone expect in regards to, you said, you know, it's a, it's a yearly, it's years, not weeks or days. What can we expect to see if we get consistent in the gym with strength and, and with cardio in improvements in our VO2 max and our strength? And um, and what would be sort of like the the lowest or the least amount of times you would want someone, say like your wife or your daughter in the gym to maintain that strength in VO2 max? So it depends on many things, right? So genes definitely play a role in both of these things. So people have different body types. People have a different propensity to gain muscle mass. Um that's true of men and that's true of women. And similarly, people have a you know dramatically different genetic ability to gain cardiorespiratory fitness. So that's that's one thing to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is you know it's easier to regain muscle mass that was lost than to build muscle mass de novo. Um, so you know a person who's coming off an injury who is now ready to start exercising again will be able to put that muscle on easier than maybe the first time they put it on, or somebody who's trying to do the same amount of a gain who's never been at that level before. Um, you know, as far as what can be done, um, the literature is largely based on short-term studies. And short-term studies, you know, meaning like eight to 12 weeks, how much can you boost VO2 max? And the answer is like 10 to 15% in a period of time that's that short. And that's nothing to, to sneeze at. That's actually quite a big increase. Um, but when you start to talk about a 50% increase in VO2 max, which is what we ask of a number of our patients, um, then you're talking about years of work. Um, as far as you know, what the minimum requirement is, that also depends on the stage of life. You know, as we get older, we get more and more anabolic resistant. And that means we actually need more protein in our diet to put on the same amount of muscle mass. And not all training is created equal. So, it, you know, this is where the devil's in the details, which is why there's three chapters on exercise and only one chapter on sleep, for example. Um, how you train, the specificity with which you train really matters. Um, there's very specific type of training that you want to engage in to boost VO2 max. And you know, again, I would not have to go into that. I write about all that stuff, but, but the, the, the further you deviate from that type of training, um, it doesn't mean that you're not getting benefit, but you're not getting as much benefit, right? So it's like, you, you know, if you're out there playing pickleball, which is great, you're gonna improve your fitness, but not nearly as much as if you take that same amount of time and do the focus type of interval training, for example, for VO2 max. So I always want people to, differentiate between training and playing. And I love to do both, but you have to do training to, to really maximize your gains and you train so that you can play. But if you only rely on playing, you're really lacking the specificity to bring the results. And similarly, I've seen people who have lifted weights three times a week for 10 years never make any gains. And again, the reasons could be that, you know, their genes are not exceptional, but that's never the reason for not making any gains. Uh, it could be that their nutrition is not excellent, but again, that wouldn't account for making no gains. It's almost always that they're not creating enough training stimulus. So you have to progressively overload as you train um, so that the muscles can indeed adapt. So I know that's a lot there, but you know it really comes down to uh, being specific in how you train and training with, with real purpose when you do so. Um, and it's so it's less about you know the number of hours you're doing it or the number of times per week, and and more about the the quality of the training that probably makes the biggest difference. It's funny that you say that because when I when I have clients and we talk about training, I ask them, when was the last time you were sore sitting down on a toilet? Because that gives me an idea, even if they're active, if they're if they're actually feeling or changing their muscles. Because a lot of times someone 
will have trained for years, like you say, and they just are at their stagnant point and they're not seeing changes. So for you, when a patient or a client comes in and you're asking about their exercise routine, what are some questions that you're curious about in regards to how often they're training or to understand if they're if they're going to see those changes and and specifically also with nutrition um you mentioned increasing protein as we age can we talk a little bit about kind of pinpointing where you think the problems might be with a patient to the exercise question i i mean you know i do an intake with patients our exercise team does a deeper intake with the patients um and we want to know everything right we want to know what they're currently doing what their history is uh, what their training age is, right? So, you know, have you trained for a long time in your life? Have you trained hard for your life? Is training a relatively new thing for you? You know, all of those things. Um, what are the asymmetries and injuries that have resulted from your training history? Um, and then do you have any other objectives besides, you know, living longer and living better? What does living better mean for you? So we have this thing called the centenary and decathlon which is this model we use to help people think about a goal because for many people i think you know exercise is just an abstract idea that you know we sort of do it because it's good um but for most people that's not enough motivation they need more motivation to do this thing that outside of sleep takes more time than anything else you need to do to impact your health and clearly takes more effort. Sleep takes no effort for the most <laughs> part, but exercise takes a lot of effort. So you're putting a ton of time and effort into this thing. You've got to kind of have like a good reason to do it. And what we really do is get our patients to focus on what it is. And I mean, very specifically that they want to be able to do in the last decade of their life. And some of those things are activities of daily living. So, do you want to be able to walk up a flight of stairs unassisted? Do you want to be able to get up off the floor unassisted? Do you want to be able to pick a child up off the ground? And then some of those things might be very sports specific. You know, someone who's an avid skier in their 40s or 50s might say, I still want to be able to ski in the last decade of my life. Now, I'm not going to be going down, you know, ripping moguls, but I'd like to be able to go down the bunny slope with my grandchildren. Love that. Now, that's a very realistic goal. But let me tell you, if you don't train for that, it won't happen. Mm -hmm. You will, you know, you will, as you alluded to, you will experience the sarcopenia, the loss of balance, the loss of strength and power that will prevent you from being able to do any of that stuff in the last decade of your life. So um, we get people to be very clear on what their goals are. We figure out what are the requirements? What are the physical and physiologic requirements to hit those goals? And then we back out knowing the rate of decline of those metrics where they need to be earlier in life. And most people are woefully under where they need to be. So in their 40s and 50s, even though they're plenty strong enough to do what they want to do later, they're not strong enough when you consider how much they're going to fall. So they actually need to get bigger, stronger, faster, so that by the time they're, you know, 90, they're at that objective. I love it. Backing into it. So are, when you talk about the decathlon for you, what are some of those, what are some of those metrics? Well, I, you know, a lot of the things I mentioned, certainly everything I've mentioned, I want to do, I want to be able to lift a suitcase and put it in the overhead compartment of an airplane. Um, I want to be able to carry a suitcase up an escalator or a flight of stairs, then an escalator that's not working or a flight of stairs. Um, I want to be able to play on the floor, so lay on the floor and play and then get up. Um, I want to be able to drive a race car still, so something I still do. Um, and I, I want to be able to do it within about, you know, 8 to 10% of the speed that I can still do it. Um, I want to be able to pull a bow back in archery, obviously not nearly as heavy as I pull it back today. Um, and I want to be able to walk unassisted over you know, relatively, you know, rough terrain, not necessarily mountains, but, um, you know, I, I don't want to only be able to walk on a smooth surface. Um, I'd like to still be able to swim half a mile. Um, and, and I have a number of other things like that. So it's, it's pretty ambitious stuff for someone in their 80s or 90s, no doubt. But you've set 
you've set the goal point and you're able to work back. So what is some of the daily activities that you're doing to maintain that strength and agility to be able to say hunt on some crazy terrain <laughs> in your 80s? <laughs> yeah, so it's, you know, first of all, it's knowing that a big part of that is, you know, strength, balance, um, endurance. And I know how to train those things today. So for example, I know that I really want my VO2 max to never be below, you know, the high 20s, right? So I never want my VO2 max to be below about, you know, 28. In an ideal world, to be able to keep my VO2 max at 30 in the last decade of my life would be remarkable. A, a VO2 max of 30 allows you to do most things. Now, if a person shows up in my practice and they're 50 years old and their VO2 max is 30, that's a four alarm fire. And it happens quite often. Because if your VO2 max is 30 when you're 50, and it's going to decline at, you know, at least 10, if not 15% per decade, well, that's a person who's going to be in the teens in the last decade of their life. And once your VO2 max is in the teens, you have a hard time doing anything. It's a chore to just walk from the car to the grocery store, let alone push the cart back to your car. So that's, you know, for example, knowing all of that, I know where I need my VO2 max to be in my 50s, where I am today. And I know how much strength I need to have today. And I know how much I need to be able to work on things like lower leg variability and reaction time and balance, because those things are declining. Um, but you know, there are some very specific types of exercises we do to challenge ourselves and build up movement reserve. This is very similar to what you do with your brain. Uh, nothing is a better predictor of dementia avoidance than cognitive reserve. So the higher a person's cognitive reserve, um, the more likely they are to not notice or at least you know, stay, keep their glider up as cognition declines. And, and there's you know, non-pathologic decline in cognition that we all experience. So you know, we all experience this shift in intelligence from fluid intelligence to crystallized intelligence. We experience a reduction in executive function uh, and processing speed and memory. But the more challenged we are, and that doesn't necessarily mean doing the same thing over and over again like a crossword puzzle, <laughs> um, but it means you know, reading more books, you know, being more cognitively engaged in the world, um, the higher our cognitive reserve, the more of a buffer we have to that decline. Right. It's, it's that hormesis and training and hormesis to the brain, like just get yourself to a place where you're so focused and tired and burnt out. And, and that's where you're, that's where the growth happens. Right. So for, for moms with young children, I think about, you know, I feel so lucky, honestly, that my parents put me in sports and they, you know, in the times when I didn't want to go, they made me go. Cause not only was it the place where I found my best friends and camaraderie, but it became a, a source of physical confidence and strength for me as a child through all of it, through high school, through college, through extended learning, all of it. And I, I think it's the biggest gift that we can give our kids. For parents whose children or um, young teens want to pull out of sports or aren't as physically active, what recommendations do you have for them? Because you talk a lot about like physical fitness and the age of an athlete what can we be doing with our kids to ensure that they have that muscle memory later in life when, you know, maybe they're in med school or they just had a kid and they, they can't be as active as they normally are? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that sports come in all, all shapes and sizes. And so, you know, if, if a kid does like, and I look at my three kids, I mean, they're totally different in terms of the sports that they love and that they like. And, you know, I would say, you know, um, they certainly love, you know, traditional sports, but I, I'm also trying to infuse in them, as is my wife, a sense of like what exercise is all about and what, um, you know, how that's something you do for life. So, you know, my daughter, who's 15, loves volleyball. That's her favorite sport. Um, but we sort of, you know, explain to her that, look, you're probably not going to play volleyball for your whole life. Um, in yeah. fact, there's a pretty good chance you're not going to play in college, truthfully. Let's be completely honest, right? Yeah. And if you do, it'll be rec, and that'll be great. But then at some point, you're going to be out of college, and you're probably not going to be playing volleyball. Mm -hmm. So what will you do to stay healthy? Mm -hmm. And you can see what your mom and your dad do. 
Um, and you may adopt something else, but you know, we like having our kids around when we exercise and there's just kind of an osmosis around the, you know, the fun of the workouts, especially on weekends when, you know, we'll, we'll do sort of, we'll do workouts together. And it's kind of like a game, you know, you're timing things, you're running around, pushing this, doing that. Um, so it's almost like you're, <laughs> I don't want to say you're tricking them, but like it, it's, they understand that we're there exercising, but it's not maybe as rote as some of my workouts are where I'm really trying to be specific and dialed in. Like, I, you know, I don't think my kids would want to join me on my interval training sessions on the bike, uh, <laughs> even if they could keep up because that's, you know, maybe that's a step too far, but you know, standing on the sled while I push it back and forth and then getting their own little dumbbells and walking back and forth with me, that's something everybody can do. Right. Well, I will say, you know, it translates from the nutrition research that I've done with kids, which is modeling, modeling and exposure is the best way to encourage your kids to follow in your footsteps and without, you know, nagging them or just yeah. communicating about it, it, it has way better outcomes. So it's no surprise there. And what a great way to to have a build, build a relationship with your kids in an active way. I mean, some of my best memories are actually skiing mammoth with my dad. And I remember him, you wouldn't like this, but he would train for a specific amount of time in our little, in his little like garage gym just to ski. And then when skiing season was over, he wasn't very active, but at least I did see that. Um, oh, yeah. So kind of changing gears towards um, your second domain, which is nutrition. Um, how, how are you working with your family, not your clients, but how are you eating as a family? And, and what does that modeling and exposure look like? And are you dialed into your children's um, macronutrients and micronutrients? Like how much protein they're eating? And they're, you know, how are you having those conversations with your kids too? Well, I mean, I agree with what you said a second ago. And I think that is important is... Um, it's it's more important, I think, to just model for them healthy behaviors around food and understand that, especially for kids that are active, you've got a lot more wiggle room on what they eat. Um, so um, the first thing is, you know, we love to cook. So I think I feel fortunate that, you know, I grew up in a restaurant. So cooking was something I was exposed to my whole life. And um, it's you know, it's probably the only thing I ever did with my dad. So that's kind of like the one, I think if there's one thing I did that I could say like, well, what did I do with my dad? It was, it was cooking, watching him cook at the restaurant. And, um, and so, you know, we cook all our meals at home. Like we never order food in, right? I mean, that's a very, that would be an almost unheard of thing to do. So our kids are just, they, they see us cooking. And, and I think there's no shortage of data to suggest that when you cook food, it's better than when you buy food out. So just by default, I think, you know, our kids are being exposed to much healthier food than if we were, you know, going out or ordering in every night. Um, and I don't think you have to be like, I, I don't want to for a second suggest I'm like some Michelin star chef, like yeah. not at all, right? This isn't, that's not what it's about. I mean, we're not making the most complicated things. Um, but, you know, our kids are seeing a relatively continuous rotation of simple similar healthy foods and therefore when they want you know to eat some junk food it's really not that big a deal because it's not displacing good food it's kind of a treat um and, and my wife and i don't see completely eye to eye on this if i'm going to be completely honest but at the same time I, I i need to be kind of deferential to her world which is she has a tougher job with the kids than i do so you know, she's the one that day in and day out has to make sure that they're happy at lunch at school. And so, yeah, she's going to put in snacks that I'm sort of like, oh, boy, should they be eating that crap? Yeah. And she's like, you know what, they kind of eat all their food. And if this, if the Cheez-Its or the whatever, you know, Pringles or whatever is kind of like the treat that they want, like, it's not that big a deal. And I think she's right. Um, so I don't know what the balance is. But I, I worry that if you were too extreme and you said the kids can never have that food, you potentially set them up for problems later in life when, when they rebound and rebel like crazy. And conversely, if the kids never know what it's like to have, you know, staple meals of salad and roasted vegetables and rice and potatoes and chicken and fish and steak, like if they're not eating really wholesome food, 
um, and they're only living on processed food, I think that's that's an even bigger problem. So you've got to kind of figure out what what your goals are as an individual, as the adult, and then morph them into those goals. And um, and I think the details are far less important. You know, I, people spend so much time majoring in the minor and minoring in the major, and it's like, oh, you know, should they eat this or should they eat that or you know how much dairy and how much this. I mean, I think you know, let their reaction to the food be the guide. There are kids that can't eat dairy. Great. Then they shouldn't eat dairy. Right. But, but, but I think, you know, I think the, um, the, the big picture is probably more around processed food versus unprocessed food. I, I love your big picture view because I can commiserate with your wife. It's a losing game of whack-a-mole when it comes to what they're being served at a sporting game as a snack or what is coming home in the school lunch or what people are trading at the lunch tables, whatever right. the case may be. It, it really, if if we can focus on putting those good whole nutritious foods on the table as often as possible, we're, we're pushing out the other stuff. And that should be the overarching goal for sure. When it comes to your children's independence and confidence in the kitchen, like you were in the kitchen with your dad, are they getting exposure to being able to cook these meals? And and what are some of the, the examples of your favorite nourishing meals that your family makes together or your wife makes for, or you make for your kids? Well, my daughter definitely loves to be in the kitchen. Mostly, um, so, so my dad makes the best crepes in the world and he has taught my daughter. And now I, I will actually say she has taken the mantle and she makes insanely good crepes. Um, so she mostly loves to bake, but you know she also makes a really mean set of mashed potatoes. The, my boys who are nine and six aren't yet into kind of cooking, they're, but they're very much into consuming. Yeah. And you know, so um, one of the things we eat a lot of is wild game because as I alluded to, I love bow hunting. So we have four freezers worth of elk, venison, you know, antelope and things like that. And so my kids have developed a great palate for this type of meat, which is different from store-bought meat, right? So wild game is a very lean, these are very lean animals, right? Um, so it, it has a different taste. Um, and, that, and I love that taste, but it takes a minute for someone to adapt to a meat that isn't marbled with fat. And it's not to say that there's something necessarily wrong with fatty meat. I think every meat has its place. Um, but what I love most about wild game is not so much the leanness, but it's the belief that I have that an animal can't be healthier than, you know, than the food it's eating, right? So wild animals are eating wild foods and they're, you know, they're living a life where they're actually allowed to exercise and run around and deal with all the horrible and wonderful things of being wild animals. We shouldn't represent this as like blissful. Nature is brutal. Um, but I think that that's a very different type of animal and a very different state of health than maybe the animals that are, you know, farmed and things of that nature. So um, I guess the good thing is my kids really like that. They, they, they just think it's normal. Like tonight we're having elk, tomorrow we're having venison, you know, we're going to have antelope and, you know, the meatballs are made of elk and, you know, so I mean, so it's just kind of different. And now I realize like not everybody has access to that. Even if you don't hunt, it's not necessarily easy to go and buy um, wild game. Um, it just takes a little bit more effort, but I think everybody can probably find better sources of food, both in terms of their agriculture, so you know, moving more towards um, regenerative products um, than you know, just sort of buying the most convenient thing out there. And yeah, the first thing someone might say is, "Well, it costs more," and I think that's right. It does, um, and I think we just each of us have to make a decision about like how do we want to allocate our resources. Um, but I think anytime you're investing resources in your health, and the most important resource is time. But then, of course, it's it's money. Um, those are those are investments that pay off, um, and I think that's obviously true with your kids. A hundred and ten percent. I mean, for those people who aren't waiting for a tag and aren't bow hunting their wild animals like you are, I really have to give kudos to Force of Nature because they've that's an awesome company actually out of Texas that is a regenerative company that does mm. ancestral blends with 
organ meats, they have venison, they have bison, they have elk. Um, and my kids have been exposed to that gamey meat, which is something that my husband won't even eat because I think, you know, well, the research does show us that the flavor window is up to 18 months, but the earlier we can introduce these foods like you are with your children, all of these gamey meats, all of these vegetables, the more they have a palate for it later in life and, and an openness to eating those type of, of meals. So if anyone's listening is looking, looking to put some elk or venison meatballs on their table, I think Force of Nature is a great place to start. Um, well, you- I'll, I'll, I'll even make another comment on that. So for your husband, for example, um, you know, the type of venison matters, right? So whitetail is very gamey. Uh, Axis deer is not right? So you can also be thoughtful about what type of animal you use. And and one of the things that I was doing with my family when I started bringing this on board was I would do a 50-50 blend. So if I was making burgers out of venison, I would use, uh, you know, two pounds of venison and two pounds of beef just to kind of start easing them into it. And of course, now I mix venison and elk, right? So I'll, you know, and, 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 and nobody says a word. Um, so, you know, there's also a way to, 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 way to kind of do that. I love that. Great tips. So in your book, you talk about how, um, you know, eating more calories than we need puts a strain and also a strain on blood glucose levels, displaces nutrients. And this is like a major concern. And you alluded to it being a problem lower down on the list, but metabolic issues. When you're focusing on nutrition, how important is energy intake and calories? And how important is blood sugar regulation and metabolic health? And you know, this is obviously a huge fight in in the nutrition space, but I I think you have a a great way of wrapping our heads around it. So can you can you talk a little bit about that? Well, they're both really important. So the question is probably one of where do they overlap, where do they differ, and where is causality? Now, the more common thing that I find people arguing about is what matters more: the total amount of energy intake or the macronutrient distribution, what constitutes that energy intake. Mm -hmm. And I think here, you have to think of it not as either or, but kind of the order of prioritization, right? So in mathematics, we would call this, what's the first order term? What's the second order term? What's the third order term? And as you move down the line, it's sort of like, things become a little less important as you move down the line. So I was explaining this to people, say, look, if you were about to be thrown off a sinking ship, what's the order in which things matter? So the first order term is the lifeboat, Mm -hmm. right? Like nothing else matters if you don't have a lifeboat. Okay, the second order term might be water, fresh water. Mm -hmm. The third order term might be a radio or a flare. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the 10th order term is sunglasses and sunscreen because you are going to get smoked out there. Yeah. So does that mean that the sunscreen and the, you know, the sunglasses don't matter? No, they just don't matter as much as the nine things in front of them. So through that lens, I would say the first order term is total energy intake. The total number of calories consumed is probably the first order term. And if it is in excess, it probably doesn't matter as much what makes it up. So a perfectly wonderful, regenerative, whole foods, plant-based diet that is a thousand calories a day too much is still going to be a huge problem metabolically. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is there's a reality to this that transcends just the artificial thought experiment that I gave. Because the truth of it is, if you're really eating wholesome, real foods, it would be very difficult to overeat them to the tune of a thousand kilocalories a day. Mm -hmm. So while we can think about that as an experiment and even design experiments where we do that, if left on their own, most people wouldn't be able to do that. Conversely, if I said, you know, and I think someone's even done this, you put somebody on a junk food diet, literally you put them on McDonald's and Kit Kat bars, but you do it at a caloric deficit, they will actually in the short term get healthier. Now, these experiments haven't been done over the long, long, long term, but clearly over the short term, three to four months, they will improve 
And that is kind of proof positive that the caloric deficit is the first order term. Now, what again, why would that not work in the real world over the long haul? Well, notwithstanding the fact that they're probably deficient in so many micronutrients, it would be very difficult to remain satiated and continue to consume in modest quantities if you're eating a diet that is basically a hyper demonstration of crap. So when we really think about ad libitum eating in the real world, we probably want to think that you know, nutrient-dense foods trump nutrient-poor foods, foods with less processing trump foods with more processing, foods with less sugar in them and less salt in them and less um, artificial fats in them. And by artificial, I mean fats that are injected as preservatives as opposed to fats that exist naturally in the, like, you know, eating avocado and, you know, that's high in fat, but it's sort of naturally fat versus when you're looking at something that has hydrogenated oils injected into it to preserve its shelf life. Mm -hmm. So that's probably why the obvious seems obvious. But again, what I think people get lost in, and I don't envy you because this is your world and not mine, is it's the my diet versus your diet, this tribe versus that tribe. Um, and I, I just have a general rule for my patients, which is as a general rule, if a packaged food has a name diet on it, like keto bar, <laughs> vegan bar, like it's actually probably not something you should eat. Yeah. You know, it consider it a treat, but not a staple of your food. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, I could easily put myself out of work if people made their own meals at home and made them from whole foods and got outside in the sun, moved their bodies and got some good sleep. You know, what you've done in your book Outlive is you've gone into the details of the science to, to put proof in the pudding and give people these important domains and the resources to follow through on that so that they can have their decathlon, centenarian decathlon at the end of their life and they can bow hunt and ski and get on the ground with their grandkids. And, and it is it is so important, especially I just turned 40. So I feel like I'm at that point where I'm really thinking about all of these things and how I can how I can show up for my family in the best possible way. So I really appreciate this book and all of the effort you've put into it. I think before we close up, I want to I want to talk about the last two. I know we really went into the details on exercise. I mean, there were three chapters on it um, and nutrition, but when it comes to when it comes to sleep and um, and even you know your activity levels like VO two max. Uh, those those markers. Are you? How can someone who doesn't have access to your program start tracking some of these things? And what are some of your favorite ways to track VO two max, strength, and sleep, so that they can see like really where they are? Start measuring and 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 setting their goals appropriately. So there are ways to estimate VO two max, and I, I think I write about a few of them in the book. Um, but there are tests you can take. So if you if you're a runner, for example, you always want to test VO two max doing the cardio activity that you would do. So if you're a runner, you would test it while running if you're, or, or at least on a treadmill, if you're a cyclist, you would want to do it on a bike. So there are tests you can do where, you know, th there's something called the Cooper's test, for example, where you look at how far you could run in a given period of time. I think it's 12 minutes. And based on that time, it you get a very good estimate of your VO2 max. Uh, that said, in most cities, you're going to be able to find a lab where you can go and test your VO2 max. Um, it's not that expensive. You know, we're talking about $100, $150. So, you know, roughly on par with the cost of getting a DEXA scan, which is a scan that would tell you your bone density, muscle mass, fat mass, et cetera. Um, so I do think, you know, coming back to a theme at the beginning, you do need to measure these things because you kind of have to know where you stand and you don't have to do it that often. I think you measure something like this once a year and you not only know where you stand, but you kind of have a, a goal for what you need to do to, to make those things better. And again, hopefully in the book, I've done a good enough job to lay out for people how to do that stuff, um, including what some of the strength tests are that you would want to be able to have as metrics for, um, you know, what, you know what, should, what standard should you hold yourself to? Um, you know, as far as sleep, there are lots of sleep trackers out there. They certainly vary in how they work and their accuracy. Um, there are, you know, a couple of surveys that we generally have our patients start with. Again, I think I link to all of them in the book where people can take these three or four surveys and just out of the gate, get a, a baseline assessment of, you know, are you sleeping well? 
Um, you know, what, what's your daytime sleepiness level like? How is your sleep hygiene? Are you at risk of sleep apnea? Um, and if a person comes back, you know, and it suggests that they need some sleep, um, then I think there are lots of steps to be taking around improving sleep hygiene. Um, and, you know, I, I would say that it starts with really a, a set of things that are pretty basic, like, um, again, basic conceptually, but sometimes hard to do, right? Mm -hmm. So, are you going to bed and waking up at the same time every day, including weekends, more or less? You know, can you can you have a bedtime and wake up time within an hour across the entire course of the week? Not doing that constitutes something called social jet lag, where you dramatically change that. By the way, it sounds like your audience has the same issue I do, which is we have little kids, so we don't have to worry about that. We're yeah, up at the same time every day. Toddler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Doesn't doesn't matter. We're all, we're always up between five and six in the morning. Same. It doesn't matter what day of the week or year it is. <laughs> like, please, it's uh, Christmas. Give me ten more minutes. <laughs> yeah, no chance. So um, uh, then you want to make sure that the room is really cool. The room is really dark, and you're not being stimulated by call it aggravating things before bed. So. Again, I don't think that means you shouldn't watch TV before bed, depending on what you watch, but it almost assuredly means you shouldn't be buried in work emails or social media before bed because it's very difficult to look at those things and not have some amount of anxiety or cortisol being triggered. Um, and that's really going to stand in the way of, of you know, your ability to sleep. Yeah, those are great. I love that you're being realistic because I know that that's you know, some people do unwind watching a show on Netflix with their spouse or reading a book or, but the the work emails and the social media, I mean, that's definitely very stimulating. And then last but not least, your, your fourth domain is all about emotional health. And um, we can, we can do like a little quick fire for this one. I was just, I'm curious for you, what has been what would you say is the best habit for supporting your emotional health? And what do you think everyone or what would be a, the best prescription for someone looking to kind of uh, really focus on emotional health without burying it like a lot of us do, which is let's focus on work and working out and our family. And we're sort of your, your podcast, The Drive, we're just driving, right? We're just moving forward without really focusing on what's happening inside. So what, how can people tap into that daily and, and check in with themselves? You know, it's a good question. It probably depends on their level of introspection to begin with. Um, so I think for me, you know, the combination of therapy and the type of thought process that therapy brings, which has taken years, is the most valuable part of it. It's the ability to ask myself questions when things are going poorly, when I'm not you know, when I'm not feeling well, like what, what do my feelings mean, right? I, I mean, if, if, if you sort of can, can look and examine why you feel a certain way um, without being judgmental about it, but just ask the question from a place of curiosity, um, then I think you're going to make huge gains. But I don't think that that's something most people can do without a lot of coaching to get there. So I guess if I was going to pick one thing, I really do think therapy is a remarkable thing. It's a shame that we view therapy as a society as something that you do when there is a problem. And while that is certainly true, I think we should, we should really think about therapy through the lens of health span, right? You don't want to wait until you break your leg to start exercising through the lens of PT. You want to exercise so that you don't end up falling and breaking your leg. And similarly, although it's hard to convince people of this, I don't think you should wait till you have a crisis to go and get therapy. I think it's great to find a therapist who you really connect with, who really challenges the way you think, um, and who really gives you a different way to look at both yourself and others. Um, and you should do that long before there's a crisis so that you can start to build um, the you know, emotional tools to, to deal with with distress as it comes your way, which invariably it's going to. It's a phenomenal advice. I really, I really wish that it wasn't so there wasn't a stereotype around therapy because it really can be looked at as a life coach, a business coach, a person who can help you process those traumas and really grow personally to be the best version of yourself. And we can only do that when we get out of our own way. And 
for a lot of us, we don't even make the time to figure out what's going on upstairs. So no. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for your time and for being here. Dr. Atia, where can people follow along? Where can they learn more? Where can they snag your book? I'm sure many of them have it already, but it, it was a good, good reminder. So thank you for being yeah, here. Yeah. Um, no, thank you. I really appreciate it. The book is available anywhere people buy books. Um, and probably the easiest place to find out what we're doing is either on earlymedical.com, where we have a course that might be of interest to folks that's kind of like... Um, probably the closest it would be, you know, our patient, our practice is really small. We're not really taking any new patients, but this program is like a do it yourself version of what we do. And so earlymedical.com is where people would find that. And then, as you mentioned, the podcast, which is, um, you know, comes out every Monday, it's called the drive. Doesn't refer to, uh, the, you know, drive of purpose. It actually just refers to driving. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your hobby. Um, You're but, racing. But, uh, Your love for racing. That's right. Yeah, it's going for a drive. But yeah. but uh, yeah, so those would probably be the best places. Well, I will link everything in the show, show notes. And thank you for making... Um, a version of your practice accessible to the community. Um, I'll link your Instagram website and all of the rest. Thank you again for being here. Congratulations on your amazingly successful book. And I'm looking forward to following along in the future. Well, thank you so much for reading it. And thank you for having me as a guest.